introduce our speaker, Zara Ferris. I greet you all with the Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And good evening, and thank you so much to everybody for coming down here tonight. Um, it has been a beautiful day outside, so thank you for capping it with the, you know, gathering here in this session. And I hope there's something that we can all gain from this evening in our discussion. Now. I've been asked to talk about um, empowering women in the, context, in the context of two different approaches, Islam and feminism. Now, just before I begin, I would like to preamble this with the fact that because this is about discovering Islam, and there will be some discussion on feminism, I am going to spend a little bit more time on talking about Islam so that you can understand about that, um, but making important comparisons between the two. And also, because the title is a question, and we don't have a feminist on the panel to defend feminism or to speak for feminism, it's not fair to uh, criticize too much, um, although I will present uh, the case for my position, and hopefully we can have an interesting discussion with the audience as well. Now, <clears throat> to begin, <clears throat> as Muslims, uh, we believe that Islam provides a solution to all human problems. And we believe that God asks us, as Muslims, to be problem solvers using these solutions. So God says, for example, in the Quran and in the Hadith, which are the sayings and actions of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, peace be upon him. So we learn from the some angles and some approaches in which we are told that Muslims are expected to be problem solvers. One of those is that, for example, even something as simple as removing an obstacle from a road constitutes in Islam an act of charity because it means it's a problem solved for the next person that comes along. Similarly, something as small as lifting someone's mood by smiling is also considered an act of, an act of charity in Islam because, again, it's considered something, although it might seem a small problem solved, but a problem solved nonetheless for somebody else. On a more grander scale, we're commanded to find cures for sicknesses. In other words, to study medicine and advance the study of cure and healing. We're ordered to try to alleviate the plights of others, whether that be through the economic system or the social structure of society, to make sure that we are able to help others that are in need, whatever their position may be. So as Muslims, we are given the duty of, and we are hopefully, or we aim to be rewarded for, solving problems. So in this vein, the Quran demands, or, or, or commands us rather, to call to what is right and to discourage and call against what is wrong and what is harmful. So we are meant to be advisors and problem solvers. And that is the service of Muslims uh, to everybody, regardless of our gender, <coughs> regardless of whether we are male, female, whichever culture we're from, whichever race we are from. As Muslims, this is the baseline duty for all of us. But what are some of the problems we're facing today? To tie this into where we're going with this discussion. Well. You have global poverty, injustice, all kinds of exploitation, oppression, violence, neo-slavery, neo-colonialism, po uh, pollution, climate change, simultaneous epidemics of starvation and obesity, <coughs> lack of health care for all, <coughs> hatred, intolerance. The list is pretty much endless. It's endless, but it's definitely not new. These things are not new in our society. And all of these problems, all of these, uh, you know, these issues that we're facing, all of them, in some way or other, involve either the ignorance, the denial, or the exploitation of rights of some kind. Whether that is the rights of a person, a group of people, as in whether that is the rights of creation, or, as Muslims understand it, and as I'll come to explain, whether that even includes the rights of the creator. So all of these things involve some kind of negligence, denial, or exploitation of rights. But what are rights? If we're talking about also empowerment, we usually think of rights. If we're talking about changing societies and changing things from bad to better, we usually think of this in terms of rights. But what are rights? Because different kinds of rights 
are not only invoked by virtually every different group and movement that is jostling for its own territory today, but we actually often find people proposing conflicting ideas about what these rights should be, hence why you have different groups calling for their rights rather than one collective group calling for their rights. So with these conflicting ideas that society holds about what rights should be, including amongst you know, feminists or non-feminists or, or different groups of people, how are we supposed to filter through these claims to rights and how are we supposed to discern which rights are right and which rights are not? So which rights <coughs> should society adopt and where do the other rights come from? How do we even concoct them? And I feel and, and I hope that this will give everybody a good basis in this discussion, a good foundation in understanding both of these approaches behind me. Now, whilst the focus of this discussion is women and the position of women and the rights of women, to ask the question what defines rights, we do of course have to take gender out of the equation because rights in of itself is not specific to any gender. So we're going to ask what defines rights, regardless of who they relate to. What is the basis or justification for that in the first place? Now, what are the potential theories about rights to answer this? Now, there are really only a few possible sources of where human beings can determine what their rights ought to be. And there are only a few possible sources um, from which over time we have seen throughout history that many have actually considered some of these possibilities and tried to build systems out of them. Uh, often in a trial and error sort of basis because they're figuring it out as they go along. Now, these possibilities include one, nature being a source of determining rights. I will explain each and every one of these, so don't worry. Now, the first possibility is that nature is a source of rights. The second possibility is that man or woman, as in the human mind um, or the human being in of themselves being the source to determine what these rights are. The third are concepts of pain and pleasure as a source to determine what rights are, which really also falls into the second category of humankind deciding what they are. And of course, the final possibility is God or the creator or a transcendent being as the source to determine rights. So let's start with the possibility of nature being the source of rights. Now, this is the idea that nature can actually tell us what our rights are, and in the past, some have said that the divine will, the, the will of God, can be derived or understood simply by observing nature. This was what was claimed under this theory. And that as a result, the claim was that nature itself is revelation. And according to this theory, therefore, uh, men have a natural right to subsist, to do as they please, and to pursue objects of sustenance and utility. This was all derived uh, by certain uh, individuals when they thought that nature was the source of understanding rights. So, um, in other words, according to nature, men had a right, um, I say men, the theory means humans, right? Uh, that people had a right to, a natural right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of material objects. <coughs> now, interestingly, the pursuit of material objects was later changed to happiness, which tells us something about our approach to um, the material world, and this later became known as life, liberty, and happiness. And some people call this the natural rights theory. Now, let's query this. As a source of determining rights, we see that when we look close, this is actually flawed and a little absurd. So, for example, consider the natural right to life, which is being claimed. Now, would this be respected? Would nature respect a person's natural right to life if they were, for example, stranded alone on a desert island, or caught in a tsunami, or on a ship caught at sea. They are then amongst nature, but nature does not actually respect um, the human uh, right, or the natural, a natural right to life. Similarly, if natural tendencies, if natural tendencies are the source from which we are supposed to understand our rights, then what about people that have a natural tendency, or whether it is learned or whatever it may be, uh, an inherent tendency towards either lying or violence? Would we then say that those tendencies towards lying or violence should give right to a right to be uh, untruthful or to be violent? Of course, we would never advocate this. Now, similarly, uh, the philosophers Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill observed some of these criticisms, they, they observe some of these problems. 
with nature being a source of determining rights. And Bentham even described this theory as nonsense on stilts. So they went through this phase where they, they took this as, as a possibility, and then they decided, no, this is nonsense, this doesn't work. So they came up with a different theory. And they basically argued that happiness, happiness should determine what rights people should have. And in particular, uh, Bentham and Mill claimed that rights should be determined uh, depending on what gave rise to the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And many of you would know this as utilitarianism. And as a source of determining rights, we see that this is also very flawed. It doesn't make sense, it's not a good source. And it's just as absurd. And the reasons are because, <coughs> first, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, or the greatest aggregate happiness, as the, the aggregate term is part of this, it actually gives rise to the possibility or the necessity of breaching some quantity um, of important rights. It necessitates committing some quantity of injustice for the purpose of inducing a greater good or greater justice. Because if you're saying the greatest happiness, then there is still a minority where you're saying, well, I'm sorry, you have to be you know, unhappy. This is basically, um, to boil it down, what it's saying. The second problem is, it relies on fallible human beings. It relies on fallible human beings to effectively predict uh, what is conducive to the greater good. The third problem is that it leaves blank. It's like a blank check as to whose rights are to be made central to the argument. And it doesn't specify where the balance pivots on the happiness or the number. And so under this theory, a lot of injustice can and has uh, actually been justified and can continue to be so by some obscure appeal to a future good, to a future greater good. And it can also actually lead to different conclusions depending on the context in which it's uh, stated. So for example, some have used this same argument, this utilitarian argument, to claim that pornography should not be banned even though it harmed some people because by and large it gave, or because it harmed some women or men, because by and large, they claimed it gave happiness to a greater number of people. And on the other hand, there were another group that argued in the reverse, to say that it has to be banned, because although it brought ple pleasure to a small number of people, it actually brought a greater harm to a larger number of people. So effectively, this leaves the reality that under this theory, your rights would be sourced from a state or a condition that only considers convenience. And it is basically a blank check as to who has the upper hand in that scenario. Now, another theory which comes and follows on from this is the idea of doing unto others as you would have done unto you. Treat others as you would like to be treated. This is another one that falls into the category of man-made theories about how um, rights should be determined. So the idea um, is known as the theological ontologicalism of Kant, if anybody wants to know that, but basically treat others as you would like to be treated. And the reality, again, is of course that as a source of rights, this doesn't work. Because as we know from our daily interactions, different people differ as to how they would like to be treated. You don't even have to look at this on a state level. You can even witness this on an interpersonal level, different people have different preferences as to how they would like to be treated. And to be a little, you know, um, uh, cutting about it, what about sadomasochists? They definitely have a different preference to other people in society. So it's not only how they would like to be treated, but what rules they would like to have universal on, ev on everybody else. So, for example, um, it doesn't solve the problem related to free speech. So in the great freedom of speech debate, you have some people arguing that, you know, I'm okay with absolute free speech, I'm okay with gratuitous insult, I'm okay with libel rumors, it's fine, it doesn't bother me, so it shouldn't bother you. Whereas on the other hand, you have people saying, no, we need to have measured freedom of speech, we need to have limits, we need to have uh, libel and slander laws, we need to have these um, protections in place. So that's just one example of how when people have differences of what they prefer, it doesn't unknot these problems in society, rather it amplifies them. Now, also in this category is the idea that might makes right, and you see this in lots of different permutations. So, in other words, it's the idea that the state is the source of rights, because the state is supposed to express the will of the majority of men and women. And this is known as positivism, or the democratization of rights. Now, 
Even if the state did express the will of the majority of men and women, this theory, again, could just as easily be used, and it has been used, to support existing hierarchies of power and maintaining structures of uh, their dominance in society. So what I mean by this is that many, including feminists, have noted the, uh, the problem with this theory, and I'm going to quote um, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dawkin, who, who made this observation, um, who are feminist thinkers and writers, and they said, those who have power over others tend to call their own power rights. So if someone has power in society, oftentimes they disguise it as a right. And the quote continues, when those they dominate want equality, i.e. with them, then the ones in power say no. They say basically no, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing slightly, but they say no, important rights will be violated if society changes. The law protects rights, but mostly protects the rights of those who have power. So this is an observation made about the whole might is right principle, and it has been noted by lots of different groups in society. Now, and an example of this in action is when white supremacists in certain parts of the world that were where they experienced segregation between black and white people, and white supremacists used rights, or they claimed to use rights, such as the right to association. So they claimed that they had the right to associate with whom they wanted, and whom they wanted to associate with was only other white people. And so they used this right to argue against the need to integrate. And um, when they were forced to integrate, this was uh, one thinker phrases as follows, when they were forced to integrate, the whites technically lost the power to exclude blacks. This they experienced as having lost the right to associate with whom they wanted, that is to say, exclusively with other white people. So in other words, it's often the powerful groups in society, the ones that already have power, who succeed in using um, rights in this way to protect the advantages that they have. In fact, if you consider the views of racists or fascists or any kind of bigotry, according to these theories, uh, which are, by the way, you know, um, uh, under these theories, they cannot actually be locked out by criminal or civil law if they're voted in by the majority. If the majority votes in discriminatory rights, that's it. That, that, is, that is the way that it is, unless they are discredited by society's disgust, outrage, or ridicule. That's usually the way um, pressures move. Now, one example of a system of rights that actually identifies a very important key in our discussion today is uh, the idea of human rights. And when we look at human rights, we come across a problem, and then we find a solution from it, actually, that helps us to understand this question. Now, human rights is, in a nutshell, the idea that we are owed rights by virtue of being human. In a nutshell, being human means that you are owed certain rights. So, for example, it's proposed that humans have an inalienable right to freedom simply by virtue of being human. So, if you're human, you have a right to freedom to go about and do, you know, and, and, and act freely. But if simply being human, if being human is the criteria for the right to freedom, then we have to ask why do we lock up criminals? I'm not complaining, I'm just asking what, what is the reason that we lock criminals up? They're still human after all, but we choose to deprive them of their right to freedom. Why is that? They're still human. The idea is therefore inconsistent, and the reality is, is that we decide that that right is no longer deserved. So then we understand that actually rights tend to be based on what people deserve. And how we understand what people deserve is the next question. Now, for Muslims, what is deserved depends upon purpose. In fact, I would argue for all people, we understand our purpose, um, you know, and, and what is deserved depends upon our purpose. And I'll explain what I mean by this. For Muslims, only the creator of creation of us can be the source from which we understand our purpose, the reason for our existence in the first place. So, we can see that Nature, the nature as a source of rights doesn't make sense, and many of the man-made uh, philosophies and approaches that we looked at didn't make sense. Because if it's man-made, and just to share a very um, uh, interesting quote, which I hope will, will stay with you, not just in this um, uh, talk, but afterwards as well. But if it's man-made, essentially the point is that it is really just down to someone's <coughs> imagination. 
a group of people or one person or a few people, someone's very fickle and mercurial and fallible mind, or their personal musings. And one thinker, Ronald Dworkin, described this as follows, and I think it's very succinct. He said, the institution of rights requires an act of faith on the part of minorities because the scope of their rights will be controversial whenever they are important and because the officers of the majority will act on their own notions of what these rights really are. In other words, even though there's some kind of promise that, oh, the rights of the minority will be considered, ultimately the minority has to rely on the good faith uh, of those in power to actually exercise their rights. You almost have to supplicate or beseech or protest or lobby <coughs> for these things. So rights under these theories only exist when humans say they exist. It's a bit like monopoly money or even real money. We all agree that this piece of paper is, it, it, uh, represents 20 pounds. We just agree this. Similarly, rights under these theories only exist when everybody plays along. So does this sound like a good source on which we should rely on rights, these man-made philosophies? It sounds like something that is very fickle and very mercurial and something that is very conditional on too many uh, factors. So everything has, coming back to purpose which I mentioned because that's where we um, landed, everything in existence has a particular purpose. and. The purpose is determined by the intention of the person that brought it about. So if a person invented a car, he invented that car for the purpose of getting a person from A to B to C to D or whatever, to take that person, um, you know, to be able to transport that person. And they created a very particular manual for that particular model of car. It's not for any other car, it's for that particular model of car. And that manual contains everything the car needs, Oh, this car takes you know um, this fuel. This car needs this. This car needs that. This much air in the tires. This much oil. This type of whatever. Everything is specified in that manual. Similarly, with human beings, humans were created with a specific purpose. And for Muslims, we understand that God created us with a specific purpose, which was to worship God, and with a particular manual. And I'll explain a little bit more about this shortly. But essentially. The purpose that it is the purpose itself that gives rise to the rights which are owed to people. It is the purpose that it all depends on. Without purpose, there's no existence, and without existence, there is no purpose. So, how do Muslims go about then addressing the issue of actually establishing rights, understanding what these rights are, and establishing them in society? And I'd like to point out that, with particular regard to Muslim women, the rights of Muslim women have more recently been very drastically eroded and hidden away behind post-colonial culture and modern ideologies. And that is what has caused us to ask this question today, not just about the empowerment of women, but we're asking very specifically about Islam. And usually this question arises because of a lot of um, discussion or observation or even uh, misconceptions about the state of Muslim women uh, around the world or wherever. And I say erosion, and by way of example, to show that this wasn't always the case, and there is a very brief um, 